Hey everybody, Kit Merker here from Noble9, and I am with Craig Peters, who is a PM at Microsoft, and Rita Zhang, she is a software engineer and a team lead, and they both work together. Hi, I'm hey, Craig. Hey everyone. You both ran an offsite recently, and you ran it fully remote. And in the kind of COVID pandemic times that we're in now, I think a lot of people may be interested in how to run an offsite remotely. We usually have offsites, um, you know, every few months on the team uh, to get people who are already working remotely. Uh, a lot of people in different uh, parts of the country together to talk about uh, what we've done in the past and how we're planning on uh, the work that we're planning on delivering uh, the following month. Uh, and it's also a great opportunity for everybody to meet and hang out and have fun. And we were able to do this all through uh, teams. So what would you say is, is really the difference uh, now? What, what was hard or what was easier um, given this kind of remote setup? So the, the things that were easier were really getting people to be both present and uh, both the people who needed to be there and guests because of the lack of travel. And uh, you know, we could slide things in in between other meetings and, and that worked out well. What was really hard and I think this is just natural, is that it was, you know, we lacked that sense of togetherness that you get from a face-to-face -face onsite. And so we had to do some work to compensate for that. Because everyone's remote, it actually made the people who were remote uh, otherwise felt a little bit more included. So it's actually kind of, uh, it worked out really well. Um, where it, it was definitely challenging was to get participation, right, from people who are not presenters. Um, so I think one of the things we try to do um, is to, um, you know, ask questions and get people to vote on things and have people, you know, introduce themselves. We had fun activities where, um, you know, everybody kind of went through, like, an introduction of themselves and we did this like two, two truth and a lie um, and everybody voted on which one is a lie. So that was super fun. Um, it was just really good to get people to know each other uh, on, on a different level. Um, and, uh, and so it was also an uh, opportunity for everybody to speak uh, and be heard. Uh, and, and give them an opportunity to talk about something that they're passionate about. Just in general, whether it's remote or not, how do you, you know, design an offsite that's not a waste of time? What, what are your thoughts there? Um, one thing we kind of tried differently this, for this offsite was we had this um, brainstorm session, which was really cool. Um, essentially, um, you know, Im we imagine ourselves as if we were in front of a whiteboard and have people who are interested in like say a similar area and have people like, you know, brainstorm on ideas like, hey, here's where I would like, I would like my project or, or this technology to be in a year from now. Um, and just, it, it was just really nice to have people who worked on similar areas, but maybe contingent to like uh, tangent to each other and have them sit together or, or virtually sit together and like whiteboard and think about, hey, what about adding these features together? What about integrating or, or what else can we add on top of what, we're, what we already have? It sounds like there's lots of open-ended uh, time or did you actually have a structured agenda as well? We definitely had a structured agenda, but we um, also wanted to create space for these ad hoc um, free discussion, uh, especially for an offsite, because I, I, we thought that was really important to let the idea flow. Uh, and, and like you said, you know, how do we create these uh, sessions where it's less boring, right? Where um, we, we definitely want to have this information sharing sessions where it was like more one way, right? But it was also important to have a free discussion forum where anybody can just like think out loud. Uh, and I think that was really important. The, uh, the, the important thing that I think Rita did really well in that was when she put together the agenda was she kind of alternated the directional sort of broadcast information uh, things with the interactive so that we weren't kind of in a PowerPoint blast mode for hours on end. It was going back and forth and so that we, uh, we sort of brought people in and then they could consume some and digest and then people would contribute and so that took advantage of that. Also, I think critically is that we worked in breaks and recognize that everybody needs to have breaks. And the, the third thing was that uh, it wasn't for eight hours a day for two days in a row. 
it was for several hours, two days in a row, so that people could, you know, recognizing that everybody needs, has some of their day job that they can't get out of uh, for a couple of days anytime. In a lot of offsites I've been to, you know, we try to kind of be in the room and dedicate the time. And usually the, there's a sense of that pressure of things piling up because, you know, and it is because of the travel. So the lack of travel means that you can do it kind of in spurts. Is that kind of the idea? I think we also still recognize that, that uh, you know, we're all in this environment, especially where everybody's working from home all the time. We all have family obligations. We all have you know, things going on outside of that. And we're all spread across different time zones. So when you're all co-located, you know, you're all planning to wake up at around seven and go to bed at, right. But it's, you know, we were spread to the, across the country. And so we had to recognize the fact that we didn't want to be having a meeting at 7 p.m. for our East Coast friend. You had some guests at the offsite. I think this is a really cool idea. I always like to try to bring guests, but the challenge is always, you know, adding the uh, expense, especially if they're only joining for a portion of it. Is that something you took advantage of with the remote setup? Can you tell us what kind of roles uh, came in as guests and how did you use that? For this particular offsite, we invited our uh, leadership team uh, from engineering side as well as the PM side uh, to have them sit together and talk about their visions, uh, and you know the the big ideas and 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 think about um, what is important to them and and how uh, our team fits in uh, into the overall uh, strategy and I think it was really important to have them come and speak to the team um, so that the the message can be clearly delivered um, and when, and to be to be clear like you know we've had the we have we've been inviting them in the past for other offsites as well. Um, but to Craig's point earlier, because this was an you know remote offsite, uh, it did kind of make last minute planning a little bit easier. Um, and in the past for our other offsites, we actually invited like uh, customers, so users of our stuff. And that was super uh, awesome. Uh, and you and our team really liked that because it really made the engineers feel firsthand the impact of their work. If I'm planning an offsite, what, what's my checklist? What, what are the tools that you recommend? Any tips, tricks? Like how do I make sure that it's super effective? How did you do it? I think it's relatively easy for a team like ours because we're primarily a remote team. So we use the same set of tools that we use on a daily basis uh, in terms of teams for the presentation and the interactive discussion part of things. Uh, we did use a tool that we have used for things like retrospectives uh, in some of the brainstorming. So I think it's worth making a call out to stickies.io, uh, which is just a real nice, simple way to, to do those kinds of free form discussions and gap, capture ideas. And uh, that, that's really been very fruitful for us. Working remote. How important is the reliability of the tools and how do you think about making sure that there's, uh, you know, that you're going to be able to actually have the effective offsite given that all the tools you're using are, um, are, you know, kind of served over the internet? I guess because we are mostly remote team already, um, we had to figure out a lot of those uh, kinks essentially even before the, uh, before COVID. Having something that allows us to have video chats uh, and be able to view each other in a gallery mode is super important. Having collaboration tools that allows you to like share your screen or uh, follow you as you go through a document and stuff like that. It, it's just, uh, it has to be first class today. Did you have any issues during the, uh, during the offsite? Were there any disruptions like that? We had like one guy in Georgia and he had like tornado warnings. I don't know if this was during offsite, but it was definitely during some meeting. Um, and we were like, oh my gosh, like hope everything's okay. Um, but that's the nature of running a very geographically distributed team. Audio is critically important. And we do have challenges where I think some of our teammates, I would like to you know, maybe buy them a Christmas present <laughs> as a good microphone. <laughs> When you're having an interactive communication, the audio is one of the most critical pieces for the remote communication. It's also really important to keep in mind that a lot of people um, that now they're working with family members in the house, uh, so small kids, pets, right? Like is a uh, significant other. So we are just trying to be very mindful of that. Um, so of course, 
things will come up and 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 there will be noise and stuff like that but um but that's just the nature and and everyone's super respectful and and it's just good to keep that in mind are you going to use the off-site format more frequently now because of the the sort of cost of doing it is so much lower is that something you'll do more frequently or about the same as you did before as a pm you know we participate actively in the dev off-sites but we also have PM oriented offsites. So the PM offsites are getting more frequent for sure. And uh, one of the things that I actually really like about the extended work from home is the willingness of the PM teams to get together in larger groups to do more brainstorming and information sharing, which helps me enormously as I'm trying to make sure that the work that our team is doing is better aligned with the rest of the organization. Being remote, you have to communicate differently. And that I hope that this will be a long-term benefit to the culture of companies like Microsoft. And I've heard from friends that this is also true at other companies. I think as, as much as the last offsite was really great, and I think I would uh, definitely prefer in face anytime. I think there's just so much um, a lot of like hallway conversations and um, the, you know, the kind of relationship that you're able to build uh, face to face that you, it's just really hard uh, through um, remote meetings like this. So uh, definitely, I, I would, once everything goes back to normal, I, I would definitely do the, the in-person one more. Uh, how do you see this playing out longer term? Like COVID's over and we have the option. Um, what what do you think the ideal kind of uh, setup would look like? I I think it will probably be a hybrid uh, where, um, you know, the in-person will be less frequent, but is I still think it's important to have it like maybe once or twice a year, uh, just so that people can connect to each other. Um, and I actually personally want to make sure that people don't feel like, okay, like all the meetings happens in Redmond. Like that is actually something I really want to avoid um, because we have a lot of people who is not just from that office. And when you have a lot of meetings in that office, in that location, it just, it will make it isolated for other people. We are already talking about once everything goes back to normal, maybe our next offsite is in Atlanta. <laughs> and we're already talking about places and food to eat in Atlanta. Out of curiosity, can you tell us a little bit about like, what, what is this team working on? Rita and I work in open source uh, Kubernetes and related projects. So we sit in the Azure sphere just above the Azure infrastructure uh, up to and all of the things that surround the Kubernetes APIs that users consume. And our particular domain is the open source contribution of those. So I can say 99% of the work that we do is completely in the open. There's very little that we partition off that's sort of customer specific private communication. We work, it's interesting because we communicate on a day to day basis in teams, but most of our technical communication is in Slack channels and email lists and GitHub issues. So our team uh, is kind of an interesting hybrid team in that we sit sort of supporting Microsoft Teams that consume these open source projects, everything from ContainerD to Mobi to Kubernetes itself to Open, open Policy Agent Gatekeeper. Uh, and they consume those things. And then we take things that Inside Microsoft, we innovate to solve customer problems in the open source and we make sure those get pushed into the open source community, build community around those and make sure that there's solutions that work for on every platform. Rita, any cool uh, features you're particularly proud of coming up or already released in Kubernetes that you worked on? Anything you want to shout out? There are tons, uh, but I think I would just pick one that was just recently uh, launched on Wednesday. Uh, I think you're going to talk to Michelle and Matt Klein, and so it, uh, they just, so Michelle just, uh, and, and the OSM team that just launched Open Service Mesh Project, uh, which is a, a new service mesh implementation uh, that is created by Microsoft and has since been donated or in the process of being donated to CNCF. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to get a lot more information on that after talking to Michelle. 
but we're really excited about that. We think there's a lot of opportunities to grow there, uh, as well as working with our partners and, and the whole open source uh, community. Well, thank you for plugging my AMA series that I've got going on at KubeCon. We're going to be talking to Matt Klein and to Michelle Nerali, as you pointed out, which will be super fun in the Noble Nine Slack channel. Uh, follow me on Twitter to find out when that is. Uh, on the OSM side of things, tell me more about um, Service Mesh because I, you know, I just talked to a whole bunch of people about Istio. I had a discussion uh, with uh, William Morgan about Linkerd. You know, we've, I've been trying to, trying to piece together kind of what's going on in Service Mesh, but maybe you can give me or our audience here, the big picture about service mesh and what's happening, what's shaping up in the uh, in the industry there. Uh, I definitely think Michelle and um, and the other folks on, on the OSM team can speak more uh, concisely than I can. Um, but I think in this space specifically, we're seeing a lot of um, service mesh implementations, uh, and specifically as Microsoft, we have heard users. Uh, telling us how complicated things can be, and uh, a lot of people just want something that just works. Uh, and there's, and if you think about the commonly asked features, there's only a few really, right? Um, uh, MTLS, that's one of them. Uh, and 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 you know, uh, of course, there's a lot more features that the team is working on. But um, I think the the goal of the OSM project is to uh, one, provide something that is really simple to use uh, for, for people who, who just need something for their services in the, their clusters, um, but also a, a way to demonstrate a, here is a service mesh implementation based on the SMI spec. Since the uh, start of uh, SMI, a lot of people have been asking for, okay, I want to see something that with this implement it. Um, and so that is a good uh, reference project, right? Uh, so yeah, so I think that's that's definitely the beginning of um, of a lot of uh, enhancements in this space. With the you know Istio and Linkerd and now OSM, and maybe you can explain this. Like, what's the relationship between Envoy, Linkerd, Istio, OSM? Are these all separate systems, or is there some sort of uh, stack to it? Or how how should I think about that? Open service mesh. Uh, essentially, the core of it is the control plane that sits on top of Envoy. And so it shares Envoy with Istio. And the, the point of sitting and using the service mesh interface standard is that then users aren't locked into a particular implementation. So Linkerd has an SMI implementation, Istio, there's an adapter to SMI. Uh, but if you just need the core features that are in SMI, you can use open OSM. But if you need to break glass and you need to go do things directly, you can get into the, the uh, control plane for Envoy and do whatever it is you need to do that isn't supported in OSM. And because it's an open source project, if you need to or want to, you can then contribute that back to OSM, which differentiates it a bit from the way Istio works as a community. Uh, and then Linkerd obviously has its own proxy uh, as opposed to using the, what is now becoming the industry standard, standard Envoy proxy. So I was talking to Matt Klein in another uh, video interview um, last week. And one of the things he talked about was Envoy and Envoy Mobile and extending Envoy out to um, Android and iOS. And that one of the, the key uh, uh, features of that was to give you kind of one telemetry stack, one network stack for, uh, for kind of, you know, bringing metrics back from the client um, and using that for things like, you know, measuring customer experience and, and reliability in that context, those kinds of things. And interestingly, I talked to William Morgan about this topic with Linkerd, uh, William Morgan from uh, Buoyant, about the same kind of idea with Linkerd that, you know, having a service mesh gives you a set of service level indicators or service KPIs that can be consistently um, uh, kind of served up, if you will, from the applications inside Kubernetes without having to kind of individually instrument them, giving you this kind of consistent set of data for setting service level objectives or, or other sort of reliability metrics. How are you uh, at Microsoft, your team, how are you guys thinking about the kind of connection between service mesh and measuring uh, customer experience, measuring service level objectives in the context of driving, you know, toward more reliable software? It's a great question, Kit. I, I think the the key is hidden in the SMI spec itself. So there are sort of three legs of SMI, uh, traffic shaping, MTLS, 
and observability. So SMI defines a set of standard ways in which you share those metrics. So the idea is that you can collect metrics, whatever the underlying implementation is, whether it's Linkerd, OSM, or, or Istio, or something else, Solo, and so forth. And the, the idea is that then you're, because what we see is in the ecosystem, the value is in what you, what actions, corrective actions, or value add you can add on top of the information you're getting out of these systems. And when you have a, you know, a dynamic business environment with applications coming from different teams, you have mergers and acquisitions and divestments and so forth, you can't dictate one particular implementation in this space. And so that's one of the driving forces for the spec is to have that standard way of expressing metrics. So we did a lot of good interactive discussion in terms of visioning and mission objectives, things like that. Uh, but the, the roadmap discussion ended up being a little bit rushed. Uh, and the, you know, luckily we had a pretty solid roadmap and there wasn't a lot of disagreement or controversy around it. But the opportunity to have especially newer members of the team ask questions, uh, I think was a missed opportunity for us. And I wanna make sure we do a better job of that when we go forward. In a way, you're kind of talking about like the retrospective of the offsite, right? Is that something you you did uh, between the two of you? Did you have kind of a little uh, retrospective after afterwards? We definitely have uh, reached out to everyone on the team to ask for feedback. I I also agree that the sometimes the one way information delivery thing could be really dry, um, and especially with you know a team that maybe not everybody is working on the same thing. So it gets kind of dry. Um, so it, it, for us, we need to think about how to deliver the message in such a way that it's relevant for people, but also specific enough that we can do, discuss uh, the roadmap stuff with the specific uh, uh, teams. So it, it's definitely a trade-off and it's a balance that we have to keep. I'm sure this is a challenge that other teams will face too. Uh, you know, our particular team is interesting in that we're not delivering a product or a project. We actually work on, at last count, you know, in more than two handfuls of projects. So there are folks on the team who you know, aren't really that interested in some of the other projects. And so figuring out how to handle that uh, is, a, is an interesting challenge that I think we can maybe gamify a bit. Um, and one of the things that we do that is, I, I think, wonderful is we do a lot of cross training. And I think we could, you know, we wanted to, as a part of our next in-person uh, offsite, incorporate hackathon. We have uh, hackathons in our teams uh, once in a while. And that's how we get the teams to learn about what other projects are delivering, uh, what we're launching, and just get people to uh, you know, help out with new projects, but also learn from each other uh, and, get, and get ramped up on new, uh, new uh, capabilities. So it's, it's really interesting, and this is how we cross-train, uh, and this is how the team hang, uh, uh, spends time to hang out and hack together. Well, Rita and Craig, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure was mine. And everybody out there, this is Kit Merker from Noble Mind signing off.